千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Eric Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware, as we all ready ourselves for this sacred process in the Tao. With one another. Now, without further ado, let us continue with Tao Te Ching, Chapter Fifteen. As we discussed previously, this is the not overfilled chapter, where the term "not overfilled" means. Not being full of oneself means constantly maintaining a humble attitude. This chapter talks about the ancient Tao masters, the cultivators who came before the time of Lao Tzu. They attained the Tao at a high level while remaining humble. And the idea is that we can all. Learn from their example. Let us take another look at the chapter itself. It's longer than some of the other ones that we have studied so far. Nineteen lines. Previously, we were able to divide it up into four sections based on the repeating characters and poetic structure. These are the four sections here. Section one starts talking about the Tao masters of antiquity. These are all the high-level Tao cultivators and practitioners who came before the time of Lao Tzu. He had visibility, access to the knowledge that they left behind because he was the royal archivist at the palace. Back in ancient days, without public libraries available everywhere like we enjoy today, Lao Tzu was in a unique position to sample the works, the collection of what was to him ancient literature, in a way that was not available to most other people. So he described these ancient masters. He talked about how these masters left a lot of knowledge, but did not talk about themselves. So, not being able to gain insights into their thinking process, he went into section two that you see here to describe the characteristics. There are seven in all, and the seven characteristics. Is what we were talking about previously. It is where we focused the most of our attention. These are the seven that we talked about. These are important that Lao Tzu listed because these were the ancient masters that he respected the most. Today. All over the internet, we see many quotes by Lao Tzu, indicating that he still has a place of importance in our minds today. But these were the people that he held in high esteem, so he wanted to describe them 
And he had the seven characteristics he talked about. This was the only way to know them through the traits they had in common. And we went through all of these in detail. These ancient masters, they were always mindfully aware, like someone crossing a frozen river. They were always conscientious. They followed their, the dictates of their conscience at all times, as if they were always being watched. In terms of personal interactions, they were dignified. The description that Lao Tzu used with them was solemn. It meant a dignified approach, as if they were an honored guest invited to an important function. But despite being solemn, in personal interactions with them, these ancient practitioners were warm, approachable, friendly, helpful. It was as if they were like the warm spring breeze that is unfreezing the, the ice that accumulated during winter time. And despite all that, these ancient practitioners were simple individuals in that they follow the Pu principle to be simple like a plain piece of wood. You never had to second guess them. They were plain spoken. We do have the stereotype today of these sages speaking in riddles. Such was not the case in reality. They were clear. They try to be direct and very open, very transparent. The reason why people find them difficult to understand is only because of the difference in the language that they used thousands of years ago and what we're used to today. And because of translations and distortions, people who had not really mastered classical Chinese attempting to translate them, producing results that can be confusing. Nevertheless, it's clear that Lao Tzu described them as having the openness like a valley. They were receptive to all. They welcomed all. And they were always with the people. And the metaphor Lao Tzu used was muddy water, that is, water that is mixed with dust. The dust is metaphoric of the material world. We're going to encounter this metaphor again quite a few times. So looking at this particular slide that we went through last time in great detail, now we know how they were as cultivators and sages the next logical question is, what can we do to become more like them? Lao Tzu answers this very important question by talking about a process that includes three important steps. And we started to talk about them last time. So here's the next recap slide covering what we talked about. The very first step has to do with stillness. Now, when it comes to stillness, the metaphor used by Lao Tzu for the last, the seventh, the final characteristic, as I mentioned, was muddy water. And it's directly referencing how one can be in the material world, mixing with everyone, but not taking on or be tainted by the dust. You can be with people to provide assistance to them and not be apart from people. And there is an attitude of humility while doing so. So this is central concept in the Tao. 
it is from the observation that when muddy water becomes still, the muddiness will settle and the water will become clear. Therefore, there is a direct connection that goes from stillness to clarity. This is the first step. We were also able to get into the second step. This is what we ended our discussion last time. It is the beginning of the second step to become more like the ancient masters. It follows the stillness. And the stillness is what I call a practice in serenity. Let's go ahead and explore the lines that talk about this in detail. Line 16 says, emotion gradually come alive. Following the previous line that says, who can be serene yet persist? So in these two lines, we see the distinction where being serene is not being passive. So let me talk about a key character from this line. In line 16, I would like to draw your attention to the third character, Xu. The pinyin will look a little bit odd, but keep in mind that X in pinyin system of romanization is SH. So this is Xu. It means slow and gradual. And it is used specifically because the cultivational process is incremental. It's basically an accumulation of a little bit at a time. Every step in the cultivational process is small compared to the overall length of the journey. This is why we use the journey of a thousand miles as a metaphor for life. And more specifically, cultivational practice through life. All the steps together add up to the completion of the entire journey. It is also why in this chapter specifically, we use crossing the frozen river for the same purpose, because how we proceed on the journey matters. How we take each step matters. Although each step is small, it has to be taken with care. Then, in this line, emotion gradually come alive. The meaning of this, come alive, in this context, it is all about spiritual rebirth, to become fully alive, living the life that you were meant to live. That is the effect of the Tao. In the Tao, rebirth is not the creation of something new, but the rediscovery reacquaintance of something that has always been there. That something is your true self. This is always a gradual process because the confusion that we have when we come upon the Tao, it will slowly give way to clarity. Referencing once again, the metaphor of muddy water settling down, becoming clear. Therefore, it is quite all right to start out with misconceptions and incorrect understanding because all of us, no exception, we all make course corrections throughout our entire lives. So we make a little bit of progress every day. One day, you will suddenly realize that you, you just get it. And chances are, that which you suddenly get is way beyond what you originally thought or expected. Bottom line, we 
rediscover and renew our spiritual selves through cultivation. Next line. Line 17 says, one who holds this Tao does not wish to be overfilled. So first, I want to break down the first four characters. These four characters, the first one is to hold, to keep. The second character in this line is simply this. Then the third character, there's only way to, there's only really one way to translate it. That is the character for the Tao. Sometimes people translate it as the way, perhaps with a capital W. However, what I would suggest is that the term Tao, T-A-O, is already part of the English language, has been in the dictionary for many, many years. So there's no reason to not just use that word as part of the English language. Then the last, the fourth character there, not the last character of this line, but the character right in the middle is the one who. If it's plural, it will be those who. It can be he who, she who, that which, and so on. So when we put this together, we're basically saying that the person who holds this Tao, what is this Tao? To hold this Tao means understanding the teaching of this chapter. Hold closely to the heart as something pressure. And let me be very clear, this Tao refers to the Tao that the ancient practitioners have perfected that is, the masters who came before the time of Lao Tzu. It is the Tao that we have inherited from them, not just Lao Tzu. And remember, all that Lao Tzu did was to act as a summary. He, he summarized the teachings that he learned from the masters who were ancient to him. Now, let me address the last three characters of this line. Again, I want to break them down. We have the character for no, bu, uh, very commonly used in ancient times as well as today in the Tao Te Ching and pretty much everywhere else. Then the next to last character is want, and it's a character that can be translated as desire the verb. And then the last character there is overfilled, spilling the water, that there's too much. It's excess. So metaphorically, this is just like when we talk about someone being overfilled, it is just like the English expression when you and I talk about someone as being full of himself excess. A cup overfilling with water is, in the Tao, the recurring imagery for arrogance. And when it comes to excess, we know that excess in general becomes a negative thing. Too much of a good thing becomes not quite as good. We see examples of this in our lives. For instance, tea is good, but following this metaphor, a cup overflowing with tea spilling out, not so good. We can see other examples as well. Even something like alcohol, moderate drinking, may have social and health benefits, but we know excessive consumption can result in addiction and serious health issues. And it doesn't have to be something we drink. It could be something we do. Think about work. 
engaging in work can be fulfilling, but too much of that becomes overwork. Overworking can lead to burnout, stress, problems in other areas of life. So what about free time? You, you can never have too much of that, right? In the Tao, it is quite the contrary. As sages point out, free time can be very good. Time to relax, take a break, take a breather, a pause that refreshes. But too much of it, what can happen? Too much free time can lead to feelings of having a lack of structure or purpose in life which can be depressing, it can lead to anxiety. You ask yourself questions like, what am I doing with my life? So what about something like exercise? People talk about how that is beneficial. There again, the rule applies. Regular physical activity can definitely be beneficial but overtraining can lead to injuries. The examples go on and on. Just about everything that we can think of that is a good thing, if we do it to an excess, it becomes not quite so good. Next line. Line 18 says, because one is not overfilled. So now we can see that Lao Tzu, he's making the point that the key in life is to have just enough and never too much. The Tao simplifies, it streamlines, and it reduces. The Tao does not add to excess. Therefore, when we apply this to life, we can see the ways that it can benefit us. We can see the practices that we should engage in. For example, reduce your words to say more with less. The opposite of being a chatterbox, to talk a lot, but say very little. Another example. Reduce fidgeting to gain composure. We see people who approach life with this nervous energy. Always fidgeting, never quite easy at rest. They certainly do not have composure. We know we can tell when someone is very composed when they are at peace. No fidgeting. And then a very, very much a recurring example in the Tao is about arrogance. We can all reduce ego to be more humble. Probably one of the most difficult tasks for just about everyone. That ego, that arrogance creeps in when you least suspect, and it's always there. How about reduce contention to have more peace? That seems obvious, and yet, as we look around, we see that there's a lot of contention still in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. These examples go on and on. For instance, we can talk about reducing emotional baggage to be free from the past, reducing clutter to regain space to live, and so on. Next line. Line 19 says, therefore, one can preserve and not create a new. This is the last line of this chapter. It is the most important line 
it is also oftentimes misunderstood. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, it is because of the language differences between ancient times and today, causing people to not quite grasping the meaning of this line. First, let's go ahead and break the characters down one by one. The first character, Gu, can be translated as therefore, thus, or so. Three different ways to translate that. Second character there is can or able to. So a couple of different ways to translate. The third character is to preserve, to hold on to, to embrace. Then the fourth character, Bu, is the recurring character for no, no or not. Then the next to last character, Xin, that's the character for new. And then the last character is to create or to complete, to accomplish, to achieve. So when you string it together, when you string these characters together, you don't come up with something that that seems easy to decipher. So what I want to do is to decrypt and demystify this particular line, as we have done with the rest of the Tao Te Ching. We'll start with the key character in the middle, preserve. To preserve in this context is to preserve the Tao in your life. And remember, the Tao that we're talking about is the Tao that's been passed down through the generations. And the reason that we hold on to those is because they are time tested through the many dynasties, the many, many generations. People have utilized the, the Tao principles and seen the truth. They've seen the effectiveness. That's why they insist upon passing it on to the next generation until you and I come around. So holding on to the Tao, the basics to be practical, living the simple life, because simplicity is one of the principles of the Tao. Now let's tackle not create a new. This is the this is the one that that provides challenges to understanding. On the face of it, we can say not create a new means returning to one's original lessons, but there's more. Most importantly, it means rather than to reinvent the wheel, instead we should build on the works of the ancients. The easiest way to think about this in relation to the previous couple of lines. Remember, it's about humility and arrogance. Those who hold on to the Tao, the Tao of the ancients, do not wish to become arrogant. What is Lao Tzu talking about? Well, he's saying that there are people out of arrogance who feel like they can create from scratch these Tao principles when that has already been done. And that's what I mean by reinventing the wheel. So rather than to waste time doing that, the best strategy for us is to take advantage of what's been done for us. When it comes to the Tao, the realization is that with the legacy we have, the inheritance of the wisdom traditions, we stand on the shoulders of giants, literally, so that we can look farther and see even more. We leverage what's already been accomplished from previous generations. Therefore, we have enough humility to recognize that there are many things that do not need to be rebuilt 
from the ground up. So this line is not talking about restraining creativity, far from it. It's about honoring what has come before. This is the last line of Tao Te Ching 15. At this point, we now have enough information to depict the three steps that Lao Tzu suggests for everyone to become more like the ancient masters. I would say that anyone who makes a genuine effort to take these steps cannot help but get closer to the ideal as demonstrated by the ancients. So let me lay them out for you in this fashion. The image that you see here is that of a Tao practitioner, his reflection in the water. This is a depiction on step one from stillness to clarity. It is in stillness that we can regain the clarity that we possessed before. Human beings are naturally drawn to stillness. And by stillness, what I mean is tranquility, peacefulness, quiet moments. So Zhuangzi has written something about this. He wrote something that Confucius has said. Now, Zhuangzi, in his works, have written a great deal about Confucius. But let me just uh, share with everyone that Zhuangzi and Confucius were not contemporaries. They did not live around the same time. Specifically, Confucius passed away about 110 years before Zhuangzi, the sage who would become Zhuangzi, was born. And Laozi was even before that. Laozi was estimated to have passed away roughly 150 years before the time of Zhuangzi. Therefore, to Zhuangzi, both Confucius and Laozi were the ancient practitioners of previous generations. They predated him by multiple generations, around five or six generations. Now, Zhuangzi wrote extensively, as I said, about Confucius as well as Laozi. With Laozi, Zhuangzi, Zhuangzi expressed a great deal of respect, just as Laozi expressed respect for those who were ancient to him. With Confucius, Zhuangzi has praise, but also some lighthearted criticism. And this is because Confucius had veered off into a direction where he put strictures and rules and limits, which began to pull away from the nature of the Tao itself. Nevertheless, when Confucius, what Confucius studied, and he saw himself as a disciple of Laozi, Confucius studied the Tao tradition of the ancients as well. He was brilliant in doing so. And Zhuangzi wrote about what Confucius said. These are the lines, these are the original text from the writings of Zhuangzi. Let me translate these lines for you line by line. First line is Confucius says. Second line says, one would not use flowing water as a mirror. So you can see that this makes sense because you and I would also not look into flowing water and think that we can get a good reflection of ourselves. It cannot serve as a mirror. The next line says, when we use still water 
for that purpose. If you want to check out your own reflection, you will look at still water to see yourself in it, see yourself looking back at you. Then Zhuangzi concludes, only still water can give one pause. On the face of it, this means only still water can make people stop and look, to look at themselves, to check their appearance. Now, let me also share with everyone, this passage is not really about still water or one's reflection in it. It's a poetic way, it's a poetic reference that is just like the metaphor of muddy water settling down and becoming clear. It is really about the stillness of the mind. Laozi was said to have taught that people naturally prefer the peaceful and tranquil. It is in the same mindset as this line right here. It is because when the mind is chaotic, you and I, we cannot reflect upon ourselves. Our thoughts are full of that chaos and concerns and anxieties. We cannot focus and think about how we are, how we have been. It is only when your mind quiets down that you can actually do that. You can perceive yourself accurately in your mind, just like you can look at still water to see an accurate reflection of you. So just like still water causing people to stop, to look at themselves, see how they look, to, to check, is my hair messy, is the head on straight, and so on. Stillness of the mind becomes a spiritual mirror that causes us to pause, to reflect, and think about what we have done, how we have been. This process, quieting or stilling the mind, is what gives us mental and spiritual clarity. And this is obvious from the clarity of the reflection that we can get from still water, hence the graphic that you see here. And I think you all find that this is reflected, no pun intended, on your own experience. You have experienced how when things are quiet and you feel peace of mind, that you can relax, perhaps even breathe a sigh of relief. That is when you can really be in touch with yourself. I would therefore recommend that it is important to commit to a consistent, regular practice of being serene, of engaging in serenity. This can be personal reflection, it can be meditation, or both. When it comes to meditation, you have a range of options. It's not just sitting meditation. You can also turn everyday activities into a meditative practice. What I personally do, engage in on a regular basis, will be things like meditative writing, meditative walking. There's also Tai Chi, Qi Gong. These are what practitioners would call Zen within movement. That is, the body is in motion, but the mind is tranquil. All of these make us understand what Lao Tzu meant when he wrote, who can be muddled yet desist, in stillness gradually become clear. Remember the muddiness settling as you quiet down. That's the key. This leads to the second step. 
The second step is like the yin and yang duality with the first. In the first, we talk about quieting down, regaining clarity. In the second step, it says, come alive with actions. This is equally important because the stillness of the Tao is not inaction or passivity. Sometimes people have mistaken the meaning of Wu Wei, unattached actions. They think that it means being inactive or passive. But the Tao is not just about meditation, sitting in silent reflection. That is only part of the practice. We want to keep in mind that the Tao is the source. The Tao is the void that produces all things. Therefore, extending from that, it is also the source of creativity and inspiration. What I mean by that is the spiritual serenity where you connect with the Tao is also where inspiration will spontaneously come into your mind. And I know some of you who engage in a meditative practice, you have already seen or experienced this for yourself. And the way that these things show up can vary. Some of them take the form of a brand new realization or insights, like a deeper understanding that springs into your mind. It just materializes out of nowhere. Some of them take the form of ideas that inspire you to take action. Now, as I said, it's different for everyone, but as you perfect this practice, you will, one way or another, emerge from it knowing exactly what you ought to do. So tranquil clarity actually leads to dynamic Tao-centric actions. Hence this bullet. You emerge from stillness with motivation and direction. There's energy in that and you know which direction to take. So you take purposeful action leading to meaningful results. And in this process, you're not discouraged by the task being lengthy or monumental in scope. You see it as a long journey that you must walk step by step or the frozen river that you must cross, where every step is taken with care. The bottom line is that you literally come alive in the life you were meant to live. And this is why Lao Tzu wrote, who can be serene yet persist in motion, gradually come alive. I think you can see that this line makes a lot of sense. This is step two. What about step three? Step three, Bu Ying, not overfilled, is the Tao of humility. So this, the two steps that we have talked about, it's a process that takes you closer to the ancient masters. As a result of having done them, following them consistently, you see what it's like to be similar to the ancient masters. You begin to understand how they approach their lives, and you live your life the same way. You begin to see and understand how they interacted with people around them, and you do the same thing. You begin to embody all the connections to water. 
we have seen the metaphor, water that is muddy settling down to become clear. When it is settled, when the water is still, it provides a clear reflection. It is the still water that gives one pause, so you will stop and look at yourself. Then, elsewhere in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu talks about water as a powerful symbol of humility. It flows to the lowly places, not the high profile. And again, with water, never overfilling a cup, never becoming too full of yourself. This is the Tao of humility. As you align yourself with the ancient masters more and more, becoming humble is the most natural thing in the world. And this is why Lao Tzu wrote, because one is not overfilled because of humility, therefore one can preserve and not create anew. And as a reminder, an important reminder, to preserve in this context is to honor the legacy of the ancients, to follow in their footsteps, to keep in mind the examples that they have set. Now, you and I can see why this, Bu Ying, not overfilled, is the title of this chapter. There is a lot of meaning behind that. Now, let us bring all three steps together in one slide to see how they lead you to become more like the ancient masters. In this slide, we have the ancient masters on the right and the self-reflective Tao practitioner on the left. The goal is to go from the left to the right. Here are the three steps that we have discussed so far. First, you settle your mind in stillness to regain your clarity. Then you are inspired to take Tao-centric actions. And finally, you can see the positive results. With each day that passes, you'll understand the ancients better than before. Rather than to make you full of yourself, this has the opposite effect. It makes you more convinced than ever that you need to remain humble, delve deeper, and learn more. Now, let us see how the steps tie in to the characteristics that we wish to cultivate for ourselves. Step one, about clarity. Having gained the clarity from settling down, becoming still and tranquil, it leads you to become mindfully aware as if crossing a river and conscientious, following the dictates of your conscience as if you are being watched. Now, when you are inspired to come alive with actions, you begin to interact with people and we can see a clear connection here that you interact with others with serious intent and dignified behavior like being an honored guest, what Lao Tzu calls solemn. And you interact with others with personal warmth, like the spring breeze that melts winter rice. And you interact with others with simplicity. They never have to second guess what you really mean because you are simple like a plain piece of wood. And finally, humility, being humble, understanding dawns on you, you have every reason in the world to be humble. Your attitude is open and accepting like a valley. And you find yourself 
with the people, like mixing water with dust. And using this illustration here, I think we can see how everything in this chapter makes a great deal of sense. Everything in it is all connected as a whole. And now we can see the, re the reason Lao Tzu wrote the lines, because one is not overfilled, Therefore, one can preserve and not create a new. You have all the reasons in the world as well to preserve the wisdom of the past rather than to come up with something that's already been established for thousands of years. This concludes our line by line discussion of this chapter. Having gone through all the lines of this chapter were now ready to paraphrase the lines. Our purpose, as always, is to demonstrate understanding by expressing the original with our own words. Here is how the chapter looks, as we talked about, divided into four sections. Section one starts out talking about the ancient masters. Here is the paraphrase I want to offer for that. When we study the ancient masters of the Tao, we find them rather puzzling. How were they able to accomplish so much in such effortless ways? What were their secrets? We cannot understand them directly because they are like a deep lake whose bottom we cannot see. The only thing we can do is look at their actions and learn from the way they lived. So this essentially captures what Lao Tzu was trying to say. How do we become more like them well, we start out by noting what they were like. The next section goes into descriptions about how they were. Here's the paraphrase I want to offer for that. They did everything with mindful care, as if crossing a frozen river in winter. They were always conscientious as if they were constantly being watched. They were impeccably courteous, as if they were guests. Also, they were warm, like ice melting in spring. They were plain and simple, like a piece of wood that has not yet been carved. They were accepting and generous, like an open valley. They mixed with everyone like sand mixing with water. So I think everyone, you can see that language does make a difference for some people who find the original challenging. If they were to look at a modern paraphrase, you may help in understanding. We now go into the third section which is the beginning two steps to become more like the ancient masters. Here is the paraphrase I want to offer for that. Who can be like these ancient masters to quiet down, cultivate the Tao, and clarify their understanding like muddy water clearing up over time? Who can be like them to integrate dynamic actions with serene mind in order to live life more fully every day? So with that paraphrase, I wanted to see if we could get the yin and yang duality that Lao Tzu tried to express. 
And finally, the last section, this is the conclusion about holding on to the Tao, remaining humble, and to preserve the ancient traditions of wisdom. Here is the paraphrase I want to offer for that. Hold on to this Tao, and it will keep you from excess. You will naturally wish to preserve the best of the ancient tradition rather than to create something that already exists. And elsewhere in this presentation, I talked about this, creating something that already exists as reinventing the wheel. Chances are, whatever you and I try to create from scratch cannot compare to what the ancients had created that has then been tested through thousands of years. This is the paraphrase for 15, and now we come to the full circle as the very last part of our process in our discussion of this chapter. In the last line of Tao Te Ching 15, Lao Tzu speaks of preserving the spiritual gifts that have been passed down through the generations. We link this back to the beginning and see Lao Tzu describing the ancients who were adept with the Tao. So I think the message is quite clear. First, we are truly fortunate to inherit this great wisdom tradition from thousands of years ago. And second, we should embrace it and emulate the ancient masters who created it and refined it over centuries. So the message there in the full circle is an emphasis on the very last line. Because one is not overfilled, therefore one can preserve and not create a new. In other words, you and I can approach the Tao with the perspective of humility, with the mindset that's sourced in the Tao of being humble. As a reminder, the summary that we have seen last time is about the seven characteristics of the ancient masters. This is the way they approached life and the way they interacted with people. They were always mindful and conscientious. And we can see the, the effectiveness of the visual imagery that is used in these ancient teachings just by visualizing someone walking across a frozen river or facing four neighbors watching all the time, it makes these ideas more memorable. The ancient masters, in interacting with people, were courteous, were serious, but also warm and relaxed. And they interacted in simple ways. There's nothing tricky about them. There's nothing deceptive about the ancient masters. And lastly, out of a spirit of humility, the ancient masters were always open and accepting, and they were always involved and engaged with the community. So just a quick summary of the seven characteristics, and that, and that means we also should summarize the three steps that will bring us closer to them. The first one, is becoming still and therefore gaining clarity. This is where I would encourage everyone to establish your own practice in serene stillness. Could be meditation, could be silent reflection, or both. In that practice, you want to let the chaos in your mind subside, and then you can leverage the resulting clarity for yourself. That clarity is also the source of inspirations that will inspire you into action. 
I call it connecting with the universal intelligence of the Tao. It is where you can feel the creative flow and the unlimited potentiality that can manifest in your life. I would suggest that you can let this incredible power guide you in taking your next steps in life. And all of this leads to the final step, the Tao of humility. Where we align with the emptiness of the Tao within to remain receptive and humble. Be the water that settles to become clear and flows to the lowest place. To never let yourself become overfilled, which is the title of this chapter, Bu Ying. And finally, this is where we remind ourselves that the wisdom tradition of the Tao is something that you and I wish to preserve. There's no need for us to create something in its place when that work has already been done by the angel masters. The easiest way to access Tao resources is to visit my author website, DerekLin.com. On that website, you will see links as the rightmost option. Clicking on links will bring you to the section where you will find everything listed just a mouse click away. So these resources can be very useful when you have questions in your exploration of, about into Tao topics. You can visit the Facebook community and engage in discussions with everyone there. And when you see benefits of cultivation in your life, you can share your thoughts and experiences with others through your posts, feedback, and comments. And this can be done in Facebook, YouTube, and other social media websites. If you read my books or listen to my audio books and you feel that they have been helpful to you, then you may wish to post your reviews on Amazon to help others find the path just as you have. In doing so, you may encourage others to also explore Tao spirituality and philosophy or help them with your suggestions so they can enjoy the benefits as well. With this section, you can also go to it directly with a web address, www.duraglin.com slash links as you can see here. Please use this to share the DAO with anyone you know who may be interested. This is the path that I am on myself to share the DAO with all of you. This has benefited me tremendously. And the benefits includes this gathering. That is why I would like to invite you to come along on this journey to travel along as my companions. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.